Dear friends of the Bethlehem Bach Festival, dear members of the Bethlehem Bach Choirs, I am sending my greetings from far away from the city of Leipzig, the home of Johann Sebastian Bach. And I sincerely regret that due to the pandemic, I cannot travel to Bethlehem myself this year. It is hard to imagine that there are more than 4,000 miles between us, but thanks to modern technology, I can present my lecture today from the far distance. When my old friend Greg Funfgeld contacted me about a couple of months ago to, and uh, invited me to do this virtual lecture, I was of course very honored, but at the same time, I have to admit when Greg suggested his favorite topic, Bach in challenging circumstances, I was also a bit frightened. The topic includes the question, did events in Bach's life, joyous and tragic, disappointing and uplifting, have an impact on his compositions? Or, ask the other way around, are any of Bach's works the direct result of significant incidents in his biography? I just mentioned the distance in space between us we should be aware, however, that there is also an even greater distance in time that separates us from the early 18th century. 300 years are truly a significant gap. Fundamental changes in lifestyle, in the structure of society, in the development of technology and science have occurred in the meantime. Can we come close to the reality of human life of Bach's time, to his way of thinking? There's another problem. We have access to a discouragingly small number of documents of Bach's life. There is only one private letter, while other autograph archival documents concern receipts for payment, letters of recommendation, applications, complaints, and other rather impersonal writings. Compared to other major composers, for example, the 5,000 letters of the Mozart family and the more than 8,000 letters by Felix Mendelssohn, the conversation books of uh, Ludwig van Beethoven, this is close to nothing. What we know about Bach's life comes from remarks by colleagues, friends, and other contemporaries. Thus, as a reviewer of the published Bach Documente put it, the archival documents about Bach resemble the petrified footprints of an extinct creature. They form, so to speak, a mold which only allows guesses about the contours of the creature that has left it. Thus, discussing Bach's challenging circumstances in a sensible and responsible way, inevitably creates challenging circumstances for anybody who dares to take on this adventure. Yet the topic fascinated me, and the more I thought about it, the more I was intrigued by it, and the deeper I became involved. What I present to you today are some thoughts that have occupied, if not haunted me, uh, for the past two months. I won't be able to present definitive answers though, but I would like to offer some thoughts that may be interesting to you as well for reflecting about possible connections between Bach's biography and music can yield new insights and can make us listen more carefully. Let us now take a closer look at a number of case studies. An important document is found in Ernst Ludwig Gerber's Tonkünstler Lexicon of 1790. The lexicographer Gerber was the son of the organist Heinrich Ludwig Gerber, who had studied with Bach in Leipzig around 1724 and 1725. Evidently, the older Gerber was one of the few students who managed to develop a personal relationship with Bach. Let me read to you the following biographical account from the Tonkünstler Lexikon. Heinrich Nikolaus Gerber enrolled at Leipzig University 
in May 1724. In his first semester, he had heard much excellent church music and many a concert under Bach's direction. But he had still lacked any opportunity that would have given him courage enough to reveal his desires to this great man until at last he revealed his wish to a friend who introduced him to Bach. Bach accepted him with particular kindness because he came from the county of Schwarzburg and always thereafter called him Landsmann, compatriot, and he promised to give him the instruction he desired." End quote. Now, there is an account of the works that Gerber studied with Bach, including the inventions, the suites, and finally the well-tempered clavier. And now the quote continues. This latter work, Bach played altogether three times through for him with his unmatchable art. And my father counted these among his happiest hours when Bach, under the pretext of not feeling in the mood to teach, set himself at one of his fine instruments and thus turned these hours into minutes. This quote serves as the preparation and testifies the credibility of another quote found elsewhere in the Gerber lexicon. Regarding the special fingering Bach's used to perform his own keyboard works, Gerber reports that Bach told his favorite student, I quote, that often he had found himself compelled to make use of the night in order to be able to bring to realization what he had composed during the day. I interpret this that Bach during the night hours was able to elaborate on paper musical ideas or even complete works that he had conceived in his mind during daytime when he was busy with other commitments. And now the quote continues, this is all the easier to believe since it was never his habit to in composing to ask advice of his clavier, of his keyboard. Thus, according to a certain tradition, he wrote his well-tempered clavier, consisting of fugues and preludes, some of them very intricate, in all 24 keys, at a place where ennui, boredom, and the absence of any kind of musical instrument forced him to resort to this pastime. End of quote. Now, what did Gerber mean by these cryptic remarks? Many biographers relate this to the four weeks Bach had to spend in detention because he demanded to quit his job in Weimar in order to become Kapellmeister to the Prince of Köthen in the fall of 1717. You probably know that um, about this incident which forms a very harsh punishment of the Duke of Weimar for a mere violation of protocol on Bach's side. The problem with this interpretation is that apparently, as far as we know, Bach himself did never speak about this humiliation. It is not mentioned in any biographical document from the 18th and 19th centuries and was only discovered on the basis of an archival record by a historian in 1903. Is it likely that Bach told his 20-year-old student about a story that possibly even his sons didn't know? Or did Bach, when he was asked by Gerber about the genesis of his well-tempered clavier, make a cryptic remark that actually was referring to something else? In fact, all sources we know point to a date of origin of the work around 1720 to 1722, when Bach was not in Weimar anymore, but Kapellmeister in Köthen. Bach's new employer, Prince Leopold of Anhalt-Köthen, enjoyed regular trips 
to the Bohemian Spa of Karlsbad, now Karlovy Vary, where he used to stay for extended periods of seven or even eight weeks. Bach and a small number of other musicians and servants from Köthen had to accompany him and, apart from offering company to the prince, had nothing to do at all and were separated from their families. Could the phrase, a place where ennui, boredom, and the absence of any kind of musical instrument, in fact refer to Karlsbad? Trips are documented for 1718 and 1720, and the latter is conspicuously close to the dates suggested by the surviving manuscript sources. Let's stay with Bach's trip to Karlsbad in the year 1720. Bach was absent from Köthen from early May to early July, roughly two months. You probably know about the calamity that happened during this trip. The obituary describes it as follows. I quote, After 13 years of blissful married life with his first wife, the misfortune overtook him in the year 1720 upon his return to Köthen from a journey with the prince to Karlsbad of finding her dead and buried, although he had left her hale and healthy on his departure. The news that she had been ill and died reached him only when he entered his own house. Bach certainly was struck deeply by this tragedy, but are there any repercussions in his works? About 25 years ago, the German musicologist and violin teacher Helga Töne has claimed that the cycle of sonatas and partitas for solo violin, and especially the famous Chaconne from the second partita, constitute Bach's musical reaction to this biographical turning point. Töne did not search for documentary evidence, but in fact proves her claims by resorting to rather abstruse research into number symbolism. In her views, Bach's Chacon is full of hidden references to the Lutheran hymn Christ lag in Todesbanden, and she came up with the idea to make these alleged quotations audible in a composition she called Mori Moore. Since the mid-1990s, numerous recordings have been made and countless concerts have been organized in which a violinist plays the chacon and four vocalists sing the hymn tune simultaneously. Let's listen to an excerpt. Thank you. 
we just listened to an excerpt from a composition called Mori Moore, which combines Bach's Chacon for solo violin with uh, lines of the choral Christlag in Todesbanden. To me, this sounds simply wrong. The metrical proportions, the length of the phrases, the carefully building up of tension in the original, nothing fits anymore. In addition, I would add that an Easter hymn like Christlag in Todesbanden does not seem to be very fitting for a lament. This may be my personal subjective reaction, but is there any hard evidence? Bach's beautifully written autograph of the violin solos, one of the greatest treasures of the State Library in Berlin, does indeed contain the original date, Anno 1720. However, we have to ask for criteria that allow us to date the manuscript even more precisely. If we would hold the manuscript up against light, we would recognize in the paper a watermark that is not found in any other Bach autograph. It is a unique paper. Paper historians have been able to trace this watermark to the paper mill of St. Joachimsthal, today Yachimov, a small town in western Bohemia, less than 20 kilometers, that is about 12 miles away from Karlsbad. It is hardly surprising that the archival materials of the Köthen court do not contain a single sheet of this paper. And there is no reason why they should have bought it in Köthen. Other paper mills were much closer. Thus we can claim with due certainty that Bach must have acquired the paper while he was in Karlsbad. I know that there are a number of speculations that can be constructed, but the simplest explanation would be during the roughly eight weeks in Karlsbad without any formal commitments, Bach used his ample spare time to prepare his highly calligraphic fair copy of the violin solos, works that he may have sketched before in Köthen. In other words, the cycle of sonatas and partitas was completed before Bach had the slightest idea about Maria Barbara's illness and death. Thus, Mori Moore is an artifact of the late 20th century that does not bring us closer to Bach's personality. You can compare the famous face on Mars picture taken by the Viking orbiter during a Mars expedition in the 1970s. It looks striking at first sight, but eventually was recognized as an optic illusion. I would suggest we'll leave these dramatic events and their even more dramatic misinterpretation now and move on to other, hopefully more fruitful cases. It must have been a truly uplifting moment for Bach when he was appointed as cantor of the St. Thomas's School in Leipzig in 1723. This was the most prestigious municipal job in central Germany. At the age of 38, Bach must have recognized this as the peak of his career. Bach and his family arrived in Leipzig from Köthen on May 22, 1723. One week later, he performed his first cantata, a work that he had prepared while still in Köthen. And yet another week later, on the 6th of June, he presented his second piece, the newly composed cantata, Die Himmel erzählen die Ehre Gottes. The heavens are telling of God the glory. That's the catalog number 76. We have to assume that Bach was full of enthusiasm about the opportunities and the artistic potential of the new position. 
I think the first movement of Cantata 76 gives us some insight in Bach's mood. To fully understand what he attempts in this first Leipzig works, we need to take a brief look at the historical context. Bach had become acquainted with numerous new people, his colleagues at the St. Thomas School, the students who sang in the choir, the orchestral musicians employed by the city of Leipzig, and many others more. And he had to get used to a completely new environment. To, fa to facilitate the beginning of a new cantor, the town council usually would support him by acquiring the musical estate of the predecessor. Under normal circumstances, a new cantor would take his time to get comfortable and resort to performing older compositions, at least during the first months in office. In Bach's case, this did not happen. And it was apparently Bach himself who made the decision that from day one of his tenure, only his own works would be heard in the two main churches of Leipzig, that is in the St. Thomas Church and in the St. Nicholas Church. He evidently wanted to open a new chapter in the music history of the city. The novel approach can be recognized very clearly in every movement of Cantata 76, but most notably, perhaps, in the opening chorus. The excerpt from Psalm 91, that heaven and earth narrate the glory of their creator, is a highly complex and fascinating metaphor. The text continues, I quote, it is neither a human language or speech, for one cannot perceive their voices. This text presents a huge problem for every Baroque composer, because they all aimed at representing human emotions. Bach took up this challenge and set these words by introducing a highly complex five-part fugue. Fugal writing was common in Lutheran church music even before Bach. What makes this movement so very special is the boldness with which Bach creates five completely independent voices that create an image of the constant speech of nature. Never before did any composer dare to represent the divine spirit hidden everywhere by such a radical polyphony. The unspeakable is expressed here in an artful construction of sounds. Let's listen to a small excerpt from this chorus.
Let us now jump to the 15th of April, 1725. On this day, the Sunday Misericordias Domini, Bach premiered his newly composed cantata Ich bin ein guter Hirt, I am a good shepherd, that's BWV 85. Uh, the work was heard in the St. Nicholas Church in Leipzig. As far as we can judge from the available biographical documents, this was apparently no particularly elevated or in any way remarkable day in Bach's life. On this day, Bach was almost two years in Leipzig. He and his family had made themselves comfortable in the narrow, narrow Cantor's residence located on several floors in the southern wing of the the uh, St. Thomas's School, and they probably have become used to the hectic and noisy daily routine of a boarding school. Within the three and a half years of their marriage, Bach's young second wife, Anna Magdalena, had given birth to three children. In March 1723, her daughter, Christiana Sophia Henrietta, in February 1724, her son Gottfried Heinrich, and on April 13, 1725, her second son Christian Gottlieb uh, were born, and Christian Gottlieb was baptized on April 14th in the St. Thomas's Church, thus only one day before the premiere of the cantata. With altogether seven children, their parents and the unmarried sister of Bach's first wife, who lived with the Bach family until her death in 1729, the apartment was slowly getting cramped. About three weeks prior to these events, Bach had celebrated his 40th birthday. We don't know whether he recalled that his next older brother, Johann Jakob Bach, had died in 1722, exactly in this age. At the end of March 1725, Bach had somewhat prematurely finished his most ambitious project, his annual cycle of chorale cantatas, which he had begun in June 1724. Behind him lay eight months of the most demanding and productive artistic work in which he had composed no less than 40 of the most sublime masterpieces. A few days after the premiere of the last chorale cantata, he performed on Good Friday within the Vesper service at St. Thomas the thoroughly revised second version of his St. John Passion, and two days later, on Easter Sunday, he presented in two consecutive performances to the congregations of St. Thomas and St. Nicholas, his newly composed Easter Oratorio. It is very hard to imagine how Bach found the strength to create on a weekly basis his great music, to rehearse it with his students and present it in public performances. I sometimes ask myself, whether the members of his family, his friends and colleagues, as well as his wider environment, did even recognize which enormous artistic achievements Bach accomplished during these first Leipzig years. And whether they knew which immortal masterworks came into being within right next to them. Whoever tends to assume that Bach, after the completion of his chorale cantata cycle, would switch to a lower gear, would be completely mistaken. Already on the second day of Easter, on April 2, 1725, Bach began to perform another series of cantatas, which at first sight look somewhat less spectacular but which are worked out with the utmost subtlety. 
there is not the slightest trace of physical or mental exhaustion. We do not see any traces of Bach feeling the need to recharge his batteries and recreate his artistic powers. And if you take even a brief look at the autograph score of these cantatas, and especially of Cantata 85 that I'm discussing now, um, you will be surprised to witness the ease and security with which Bach entered his musical ideas onto paper. We have to keep in mind that given the workload of the past eight months, that Bach, when writing down his music, had no time to think, to try out or to search. Bach must have begun to work on the score of the cantata Ich bin ein guter Hirt on the 8th of April, right after the performance of the preceding work. And within only one week, notabene, a week in which the birth and baptism of one of his children took place, must have finished and rehearsed it with his musicians. Considering these biographical circumstances, I think there can be no doubt that Bach, the human being that, was, uh, that his contemporaries saw and experienced every day, and Bach, the artist who sat in his study, probably in the night, if you recall Gerber's testimony, and filled the ruled music paper with his works, had nothing in common. In other words, Bach probably lived a completely normal life as thousands of his contemporaries. But when he went up to his study, he, metaphorically speaking, communicated with the world spirit. This means that continuing research on Bach's life and on the biographical conditions under which he wrote his works will never really lead us to the true roots of his creativity. If one of his contemporaries, his wife, one of his children, or one of his students would have asked Bach about these things, I think they would not have received a convincing explanation from Bach. Probably he would have shrugged his shoulders and numbered the phrase transmitted by Johann Nikolaus Forkel in his Bach biography, I had to be diligent. Anyone equally diligent may come as far. Not very telling words, but uh, apparently typical for Bach. When we thus leave behind the biographical documents for a moment and search for an explanation that makes plausible to us why Bach's music is always so special and so impressive, we can look into the score and try to analyze its craftsmanship. Indeed, Bach's music is always on the level of the highest technical perfection a perfection that we don't find in the works of many of his contemporaries. Even a seemingly unpretentious piece, like the initial dictum or the beautiful chorale setting of the cantata Ich bin ein guter Hirt, are full of miracles of multiple counterpoint. And the deeper we immerse ourselves into the scores, the more we realize that Bach's treatment of his texts is both refined and sophisticated. We realize that he commanded an enormous potential of musical means of text exegesis and that he thought through even most complex theological interpretations. Let's now listen to a small excerpt. I chose the chorale for Uh, from Cantata 85, that's the third movement.
We just heard an excerpt from the chorale setting The Lord, My Faithful Shepherd Is from Bass Cantata 85. When we listened to this music that evidently was composed during a more, most hectic week in the spring of 1725, the question arises whether Bach, the artist, was not affected at all by his environment. I think this conclusion would be wrong. To demonstrate this, let us briefly consider another piece. Bach's Cantata, Es erhub sich ein Streit, that's the catalogue number 19, and the piece is uh, composed for St. Michael's Day, uh, Sunday or a weekday in, uh, in September in the year of 1726. This piece deals with the battle of St. Michael against the infernal dragon and the dark forces from hell. It is a very powerful piece with vivid imagery of fighting. But in the last aria, right before the concluding chorale, the mood of the piece suddenly changes completely. The text, <clears throat> a stanza from a poem by Bach's favorite Leipzig librettist, Picander, addresses the angels as gentle guardians. I quote the a translation of the text of this aria. <clears throat> stay, you angels, stay by me. Take both my arms and lead me so that my foot may never stumble. And teach me to sing your mighty holy. A very subtle, deeply poetic text. Bach chose a type of setting that at the time, in the mid-1720s, was completely novel, at least to the Leipzig audience. It is a Siciliano aria in slow 6-8 meter, a type of movement that was developed in Italian opera around 1720. And you probably know pieces like this from Handel's operas. Handel used it a lot to, um, uh, at certain spots that are very intense, um, cont contemplative in his operas. Um, this Siciliano style in Bach's arias from his Weimar period are completely absent. And in his Kötni years, we find only in rare instances uh, samples of this uh, type of setting of this rhythm. In this aria, you will immediately recognize a unique musical character. The music is gentle, melancholic, yet at the same time full of consolation. Thus Bach found a new type of musical expression for this particular text. And he does even more. He adds a second layer of meaning to it. Simultaneously to the tenor and the strings, the solo trumpet plays the melody of the chorale Ach Herr, lass dein lieb Engelein English translation, O oh Lord, let your dear angels. This hymn, you may know it from the St. John Passion, where it forms the last movement, is a prayer for a peaceful death. The angel may come at the end and guard the soul safely to heaven. <clears throat> it is, so to speak, a hidden message that Bach adds. Only those of his listeners who knew the chorale and its text would fully recognize the quotation and will be able to understand the added layer of meaning. This will not be found in the printed textbooks that everyone could buy. And of course, at the time, there were no pre-concert lectures. The aria Bleibt ihr Engel is one of the great masterpieces of Bach, and one could devote an entire lecture just to this one piece. The lines are not only beautifully interwoven, but with the utmost degree of mastery, 
Bach in the course of this piece increases the pace of the vocal line while very subtly, uh, slowly, subtly slowing down the entries of the trumpet. Let's just listen to an excerpt from this aria.
This was an excerpt from the aria Bleibt ihr Engel from Bach's cantata BWV 19 with uh, a text by Picanda and an added hidden text played by or uh, played in the form of a chorale uh, in the trumpet. Music like this does not come from someone who doesn't care about human fate, but in fact must be the creation of an artist who was overly sensitive and who had every event of his life be tragic and joyful in his mind. I think we can easily understand that someone who feels so deeply needs to build up a protective shield against the outer world. And when I look at Bach's portrait, the famous Hausmann portrait that is now on display in our museum here in Leipzig, I sometimes have the feeling that I recognize this protective shield. In his music, though, Bach seems to grant us, hidden between the artful web of his counterpoint, a direct view of his soul and of his thinking. When we try to grasp the meaning of this music, we can continue analyzing it according to our knowledge and inclination for our entire life. And yet the irresistible magic of it remains untouched by our intellectual attempts to come to grips with it. Already Bach's son, Carl Philipp Emanuel, seems to have recognized this when he writes his father in his works had, I quote, employed the most hidden secrets of harmony with the most skilled artistry. And the melodies he invented were, I continue with the quote, unusual, but always varied, rich in invention, and resembling those of no other composer. No matter how we put it, there is always something enigmatic in Bach's music, something that we cannot express in words. We probably do not go wrong when we assume that it is exactly this quality that makes Bach's music reach beyond his biography and the sometimes adverse circumstances of its origins. But it also reaches even beyond its orthodox Lutheran context, in which it is so deeply and firmly rooted, demanding a truly universal scope. The German Romantic writer and composer E.T.A. Hoffmann has found for this special quality an apt metaphor. He heard in the works of his favorite composers, Bach, Mozart and Beethoven, a voice that he called the secret Sanskrit of nature, spoken in sounds. This is tr a truly romantic image, but we can adopt it for a moment and use it to explore the special character of Bach's music further. The ancient Indian language Sanskrit is an extremely complex language, very difficult to learn and easy to forget. Could it even be a metaphor of human culture and civilization, of humanity in general? But this is a different topic that we won't explore here today. Back to Hoffmann's Sanskrit of nature. Only few people manage to speak and think in this language. These are the great artists of which every generation produces only a few. But the messages these artists put down in their masterworks can be intuitively understood or at least guessed by everybody who tries to approach them with interest, empathy, and modesty. 
I can say this from my own experience with Bach's music, which reaches back now for almost 50 years to my childhood. There are so many levels of meaning in these works that we always captivate only a fraction of it. Yet this is the reason why we never become bored of them. I enjoy the privilege of experiencing works like the B minor Mass or the Christmas Oratorio or the Passions every year in the splendid performances by the Tomana Boys Choir and the Gewandhaus Orchestra in the St. Thomas Church. And every time I have the feeling different aspects of these works come to my attention. But here we are facing an enormous task. The appreciation of music and art is apparently a feature that does not belong to the fundamental constitution of mankind. In fact, it is an ability that continuously needs to be called forth, fostered and exercised. Otherwise, it can wither or remain hidden. I think the need to realize this is particularly important in our times, in which the progress of technologies have well surpassed the spiritual progress of mankind. The terrible pictures <clears throat> of the willful destruction of ancient works of art, which we had thought to be our eternal testimonies of human civilization, demonstrated how fragile our cultural heritage actually is. Thus, the words from Faust's second monologue in Goethe's famous drama, you probably know this, all that thy fathers have bequeathed to thee, earn it anew if you wish to possess it. This quote can be understood as an admonition of an almost oppressive actuality. For us, this means that Bach's works are in need of constant cultivation, of research, of interpretation, and they need to be passed on to the subsequent generations so that they can continue to unfold their magic and give joy and edification to their audiences. Bach's music always communicates more than we can possibly know about it and about the world. Therefore, we always need to strive for knowing more about this music than we can possibly express in words. In this respect, I wish you all a stimulating festival and many nice experiences with Bach's music. Thank you for, attention, for your attention.